Hey guys, I'm sorry I'm putting out these videos late. It's been finals week and I'm packing my room up to move back home. So it's been kind of a mess, so I'm sorry that it's late getting this video out. Um, I'm going to do episode 5 of Game of Thrones season 2 first, and then I'm going to go back and do episode 4 after I'm done doing my core review. Because, you know, if you've already seen the reviews of it, it's, it's just better to do this now and after this one's fresh in my mind and to go back and do the other one. First of all, let me talk about my man Stannis. See, I never used to really like Stannis, but now watching the show and thinking more about him, that's my homeboy. That's my dude, future king of Westeros, Hollaback. And people hate on Stannis so hardcore. But let me tell, let me tell y'all about Stannis. Stannis, okay. like Nixon, was more is more qualified to be the leader. He has the better military background. He has the most experience helping with the country, and I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Basically, Stannis should be the ruler of Russia. He has the biggest claim. He's the smartest of, of the of the um, of the two. He 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 should be the king of Westeros. It's I t for reals. Runley, however, like Kennedy, he's got charisma. Runley's like butter. He's smooth. He just rolls off you, makes everything taste better, even toast. But he is not as qualified as Stannis, but he has the kind of people personality and charisma to draw people in. And that's why he has all these bannermen pledging allegiances to him, and people want him to be king rather than Stannis. But that doesn't make Stannis not a good candidate to be king. A lot of people don't understand that when it comes to the kind of debate. Yes, Renly is more popular. Yes, more people like Renly. But that isn't uh, um, to say that Renly thereby would be the better choice. And to go into it more, people are talking about, oh, Stannis, no, he's going to lose to Renly, he a punk, da, 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 this, that, and the third. And I'm just like, no. Okay? First of all, if Stannis and Renly were to meet one-on-one in, one in open combat, Stannis would win. Because who's a warrior? Stannis. Who's a general? Stannis. Who's a commander? Stannis. Who's the one who's won battles for Robert during his whole rebellion? Stannis. 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 Who, and this isn't a spoiler because they didn't mention this in the first season, but who worked with John Aaron to help be hand of the kingdom and help figure out that Cersei's children were bastards? Stannis. Okay? Stannis, get shit in. He is homie. He is good. And people, but people don't, don't know that and don't see, they don't appreciate him even though he does all these things because he's not like, hey, what's up? Let's go hang out. Let's be cool. Like Renly is. And that's really the big thing when it comes to Stannis' character. Because if he had met Renly in open combat, Done two, best belief stands with one. The only thing that Renly has going for him is that he is charismatic and has bannermen, um, and more bannermen than Stannis. And to get into the, so so if even if Renly had gone to go fight Stannis himself, he would have lost because he can't. Renly can't fight. He's not a warrior. He's not a soldier. He's afraid of the sight of blood. He wasn't gonna win. Okay, point blank. So let like, even try to make it look like Stannis is a pussy because Stannis is not a pussy. He is a general. He has Melisandre. I can pronounce her name now. Hey. And if he knows that he can beat Renly without having to spill a drop of blood from any of his men, you do that. Because that's what generals do. Generals don't go into battles all within the trying to like, let's just slam against her to see who wins. Because Renly's all like, I have more men. I'm just going to crush him. Bam. Boom. That's not how... It, he's thinking about that just... He has more people, so he thinks I have the advantage. That's great. Sans is like, I don't have the army. And even though he's a better general, and he... Th there's a chance that he could still win, even with less men. However, he knows the risk of, if he goes into battle with Renly because he has so many men, he could risk losing the few better men that he does have, and thus ruining any chance of him getting his claim to the Iron Throne. So what does Stannis do? He uses his advantage, Melisandre and her magic vagina, to give birth to Shadow Baby Stannis to go kill Renly. Because that way, he has just beat Renly without killing any of his men. All of his men are intact. Now, Renly's entire army fucking don't know what the hell to do, so now they go to Stannis. And he didn't have to kill, have any of his men die for that. That is how generals think. That is why Stannis go win this war. Bam. Don't care. Don't care. Stannis, 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 Stannis. So, yeah. And, like, he, 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 I'll admit, he is cold, and that's who he is. But they don't, the, the thing about the show is that they don't get to go into backstory as much. Stannis got shit on by people all day, every day. So as far as I'm concerned, let my boy go. Only person who can go against him for the throne is the nearest motherfucking Stormborn Targaryen. She gonna take what's hers. That's it. Those are two. 
Everybody else, go go fuck yourself. I don't, I don't care. Stay. That's my public stance announcement. And now a recap of the show. Um, well, we get the opening scene with Renly in the tent with um, Catelyn and Brienne. And this scene I enjoyed. I know some people kind of felt like it was um, underwhelming. But that's the thing. Like, someone, I was listening to a podcast of Ice and Fire. And they brought up a really good point. Is that, like, in this show, people just die. You like a character, they can just die. Middle of the series, don't give a shit, just gone. Because that's how this game is played. You are expendable. And Renly is too. He's just another of many. And so he dropped like a fly. The only problem I have with this scene is Brienne because she just killing mofos. Like just like bam, boom. I'm like, damn, calm your ass. And that's not what happened in the books because originally it's Loris who goes fucking ape shit. And I feel like they made him so subdued and he never got to really show, like, their relationship was kind of like under, was like, there were subtext in the book that they were gay, but it never came fully out. There were lots of hints though, but in the show you make that, you show that they're a couple, that they're gay, they like each other, blah, blah, blah. So why don't you just have them react that way? I mean, you can talk about more about how Brienne loved Renly and all that bullshit later on. Why do you have to give Loris' scenes to a woman? I didn't like that. But then Kat's like, girl, we got to get the fuck out. I was like, that's right, Kat. You ain't trying to lose your life in this tent. You better get the hell out of there. So then Kat and Brienne leave. Um, but speaking of Loris, he is just, like, the actor who plays him, so far he is not that impressive. He's just kind of like, he had that Jon Snow angst face on when Renly was dead and looking there. And I was like, whatever. But then you had Marjorie and Littlefinger. Littlefinger was on point this episode. He was just like, girl get the hell out and so he tells the Tyrells that like you guys got to get the hell out of here because um Sans ain't gonna take you guys in because you guys are traitors and Marjorie she just like I want to be the queen I'm like that's right Natalie Dormer you've worked on Anne Boleyn shit to death um I I was at first kind of like oh they're making Marjorie so obvious with her scheming and I'm like you know what just do it you already put everyone else's badassery out there like there, there's no subtext in Game of Thrones you just tell people because sometimes bitches don't can't take hints so just let Marjorie be badass let her do her thing and Lillafinger was doing good this episode mainly because he wasn't being put in made up fictional scenes to make him look like a dumbass the scene with Cersei and Tyrion was really good you see the beginning of Cersei, well Cersei never really had that much control but you kind of see her desperation and her just kind of being like, God I hate my life, oh my son's an asshole, oh god, oh god, her drinking and going crazy and Tyrion just basically working the position of the hand and trying his best to like get information and ugh, Lancel, little sweet Lancel, he's like a little Swedish milkmaid, he's ugh. He's so pathetic. I feel so bad for him though because you know he can't say no to Cersei and you know he's like well I get to get sex and I get to get high positions. Who goes say no to that? And then Tyrion just busted his ass. And I love just like Braun just standing there being all swagnificent and they find out about like the wildfire that's being made by the alchemist and that's awesome. Cannot wait for that shit to go down. And then you see Tyrion walking down the streets and talking with people and there are people talking about how Joffrey's evil and how it's Tyrion's fault because he's a demon monkey, which was a great scene. Um, this part is really important because I people hate Joffrey, yes, this is fact. But he's also like, what, 14, 12, 13? 12, 13, 14, one of those arbitrary numbers. So people are going to assume that the Hand is the one guiding him and making him do all these things. And since Tyrion is a dwarf and he doesn't have the greatest reputation because he is kind of like, you know, a lecherous womanizer and he throws money at people. So people are gonna think like it's him doing this because of the stigma of his of his um, deformity. And so I think it's important to show that while Tyrion thinks he's doing the best for the people and he is trying to do that, the people don't see this. It's like how the POVs are, you know, we could play like this character's stupid, they don't know that this. It's because like, we know because we see all the sides. They don't because they only see what their point of view. And I think this scene is very important to understanding that 
While Tyrion is doing good, not everyone sees him as doing good. And the scene between Stannis and Davos was really good because I always feel like they, they kind of sped up all the the relationship between these two men, how their friendship plays out, but I think this scene was really good. And you got to see, like, Stannis is cold. That's who he is. And a lot of people don't like that, but I'm like, I know that you don't like that as a personality trait. That's his character. That's who he is. He don't give a shit. Because his, they, no one gives a shit about him. And when he tried to, like, he, he wants things done his way, which is the the proper way. He and Ned kind of have that in common, except Ned has a, has a softer heart, whereas Stannis is like, I don't give a shit. I'm a ham. Um, so the scene with Davos really shows how he he listens to people, and he does reward people who he thinks is brave, and he doesn't, he just doesn't care. He does what he thinks is right. And you see the t um, his mind working and trying to figure out ways to get everything done. And so I really feel like these scenes really show you that Stannis is qualified to rule. He listens to his people. He, he knows how to lead an army. He can do things. Like, he's not incompetent. And I feel like this scene is, he just, he's cold, which is, you know, not pleasant. But he's not unnecessarily cruel. And he, he's not stupid. And I think that's important to a king as well. And being cold does not automatically mean it. You're heartless. That's not what the two mean. It cold because he's distant with his relationship. I wish they had brought in his daughter so that you could really see him having that kind of softer relationship with somebody besides Davos. Then we get my favorite character, Theon. Hate him. Love anyone who pisses on him. He's gonna go betray the Starks and be an asshole. So I hate him. I can't stand him. Maybe I'll like him when I read the fifth book. All I know is that I don't really give two shits about him. And I love how everyone's making fun of him because he comes... I always hated Tyrion because I'm just like, okay, you are a ward. You are the son of a failed rebel. Why do you keep acting as though people should listen to anything you have to say? You you, you, you lose battles, and that's why you stuck in Westeros. Like, why, why do I care what your opinions are? You are the seed of failures. Go away. Can't stand him. I love Yara and everyone taking the piss out of him, so that's always pleasurable for me. And now he's going to go and try to sack Winterfell and have this big triumphant battle and be a, a turncoat bandit Arnold Mofo. Can't stand him. Hate him. And then we get Arya and Tywin. And Arya got that mm. And she's like, uh, my brother is a badass. He's kicking your ass. Go Starks. Go Starks. Go Starks. That's totally what she's going in her head while she's pouring that cup. Like, fuck yeah. Hate all y'all. <laughs> and then Tyrion. No, excuse me. And Tywin. But you see why I make that mistake? Because Tyrion is Tywin Lannister's son. That, that mind is right there, right there. And I love how they're making that so clear in the show that that's his fucking kid. Cersei's stupid. Jamie's stupid. Tyrion, he with it. And Tywin, he, like Stannis, are both like, they're cold people, but they both also don't hide from the obvious. Ty Tywin recognizes that they've been treating Rob like he's insignificant. That's a problem. And he knows how to think. And how to read people. He's that like the actor who plays him is so good. So it just makes everything between them go by so well. It's like cause the little actress who plays Arya, she's amazing. And she plays Tywin, amazing. That scene was just kinda like, yes. And I just love seeing Tywin be this way. I'm glad that I at first I was kind of concerned that they changed who Arya was being the cup uh, bearer for, but now I'm glad because now we get to see Tywin who he is and how he leads and that's something that we would not have gotten unless we had gotten this change so I'm totally for that and he's kind of old guy sexy I know that's kind of weird but he is um Jaquen or however you pronounce his name the sexy guy with the rogue streak he comes in and he has a scene with Arya telling him that she saved the lives of three people sorry about that she saved the lives of three people and now he's going to pay her back by killing three people for her. And first she asks him to kill Tickler, who's the torturer. And then we see at the end of the episode, after we get to see the like, sexy-ass Gendry, that he did this. And Arya's like, oh shit, I thought she was full of crap, but you actually got magical powers, kind of, maybe. Um, the only problem I have with, with them killing Tickler is that there's a scene later on that happens that I think is really important for Arya's character and, a char and another character, but I'll see what they do. I won't get too pissy about it then, but I just, it's still a great scene and it really defines, like, the relationship between Arya and this, and Jaqen and all that kind of good and shit. And then, 
fucking Jon Snow storyline. Honestly, I kind of phased out because I could really give two shits about Jon Snow and his storyline right now. Like, I know what happens and I know that it's not interesting at this point. It's it's more like backstory and developing, you know, more stuff about the Night's Watch and the writers and Jon being angsty about his life. I don't care. I, I kind of fast forward through the last part of the scene. I'll watch it when I get it on DVD. It's boring to me. Sorry. I know it's not professional, but I don't like it. John. I, I like John. I like his character, but this this part of his storyline not interesting to me. It's the same way I feel about Danny. But um, before we get to Danny, we see um Tyrion go to the Alchemist and shows him the wildfire, and they have I wrote it down <clears throat> seven thousand eight hundred eleven magic fire bottles, and it could like melt basically anything and this is what Cersei's planning to use on um Stannis' army if they ever come to King's Landing and Bronn is basically like you're full of shit this is stupid and he kind of talks about like if they're throwing stuff you know they're going to be getting stuff sung back at them and so the stuff's usually going to probably going to burn the city which is a valid point and shows that Bronn he speak of the truth but Tyrion's like, I'm gonna have you make the wildfire for me now. So now Tyrion's got his own plan coming along. He about to be cool. Then we go to Danny. Danny is in Karth, and she's basically being the great white mother to everyone, telling her poor little brown Dothraki people not to steal and teaching them manners and shit. That just kind of annoyed me. I mean, I get that they're doing the whole culture difference thing, but it's just kind of like really this is so awkward it's kind of just awkward to watch sometimes but the acting is great and it does show the relationship i like the relationship between the handmaidens and how they're kind of like my khaleesi no my khaleesi you know that that's entertaining and also jora being jelly because you know he wants to get some of that khaleesi goodness but she like nah you ain't you ain't man enough for me even though you know he whatever that's one of the weird things about the, the change of jora the way the actor looks in the show is so not what he looks like in the book so that it makes like you kind of wonder why Danny's not into him I mean you understand why because she's just not into him because she just lost her husband and she loved him or whatever so she's not interested in Jorah and so and, he, and Jorah's a lot more lecherous and creepy in the books so in this it's kind of like he just he means the best for her and all kind of stuff so it's kind of awkward and then um one of the 13 the I forget his name the black guy, sorry, but the um, one of the leaders of one of the thirteen takes him to the safe, offers this proposal for him for for Danny, and is like, if you marry me, we I will give you enough money to that and ships that you can go and be badass. Jorah's like, don't do that. That's kind of messed up. You don't want to buy someone. You don't want to have a marriage be how you get your monies. And so Danny's kind of conflicted about what to do with that. And then we go to. Bran, who's being a leader, being all adorable and shit, and we got Rickon, just bashing nuts like a crazy, like a little feral child, it's awesome. And Bran is like, there's an attack coming on, and she sends out all the soldiers to go mind that attack. Yeah, that's gonna be interesting for next week, and, well, in three days. And then, after that, they go for a ride, and... Um, he mentions a dream that he had of the water, of the ocean rising and the water coming and all these dead bodies floating around. And Tonks is like, um, it's only a dream, I, I think. We're not going to talk about this anymore because you're freaking me out. But that's, I, I like, I like Bran so much more in the show because I don't have to read it. I feel like his storyline in the book to me, like sometimes it gets so dry, but when I watch it's like, this is good. But when it's like in the book, I'm just like, oh god, another brand Bran chapter. <laughs> I know it is out of order, but then the last thing you see I'm going to talk about is um, Kat and Bran, which happened kind of before. It, it happened, let's see, it happened blah, 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 after the whole House of the Undying magic trick bullshit that, um, Kat, Bran swears fealty to Kat. I like this scene, I like the acting in it, but I feel like it's very awkward because you don't really understand why Brienne is so willing to t pledge her allegiance to Kat. I mean, there's a sense because she knows that um, Brienne is innocent, but other than that, like, why is she just willing to pledge fealty to Kat so quickly? And I think that's kind of awkward. 
even though the scene is really well done and really well acted, I mean, Michelle Farley like, just, just kicks it out of the balls. But it's also just kind of weird because you don't really understand why they got this connection so quickly when they've only had one other scene together. But this was a really good episode. It really set up everything so nicely. I'm so excited for, for Sunday. Um, you know, Team Stannis, Ham, Ham better than Peach, you know, is cool, whatever. I'm so excited. And hopefully... Uh, we will get some more, hopefully, oh, okay. so Sunday I am really excited, I'm looking forward to them really developing things. There's a few things I'm concerned about, but when the series is over, I'm going to do a whole video about something I was like, pros and cons of changes that they've made this season, because there's a lot of things that I think they did really well, but there's a lot of things that I think that, like, you guys fucked up, like, for real. But I don't want to say they officially fucked up until I get to see the entire season. So, so far we're okay.